All right, hey there, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, for those uh, outside of our Eastern Standard Time, I know there's several of you that uh, have logged on. A good morning to you, and thank you for joining us for another webinar in our Client Lunch and Learn series. Uh, so we're thrilled to have everybody with us today. Uh, today, our topic is uh, the top 10 development considerations in South Florida. Um, I, uh, I'll go over a couple things here. I know there's still some folks logging on, so they may miss some of the intro, but uh, we'll, we'll get to the meat of it here. Um, so the reality is, given the complexity of each of the topics that, uh, that we have, we could probably spend about an hour dissecting each one of these. So today we're going to be giving uh, kind of a high level overview of some of those complexities and nuances of each topic, uh, as well as updates that, uh, that may impact you. And so I'm uh, Jeff Brophy, Vice President and a Division Director for WGI. And joining me uh, today is my uh, much older colleague, Brett Oldford, uh, also a Vice President and WGI Civil Engineering Director uh, for our, our Southeast group. Uh, so both Brett and I uh, are located here in West Palm Beach. Uh, we've been uh, doing this uh, for over 20 years in South Florida. We have worked on projects collaboratively across the state with a large focus on uh, the South Florida area, uh, ranging from large scale residential, commercial, uh, mixed use, industrial, you name it. Um, uh, th those are the types of uh, markets that, uh, that we've been in. And so our aim for our client lunch and learn series is to provide value to the audience and in kind of an open forum and, uh, and where our WGI professionals can begin the process of uh, lending our expertise to our uh, clients' development uh, challenges. And so before we get started, I'll just tell you a little bit about the firm. Uh, WGI is a multidisciplinary professional services firm uh, leading our profession in technology-based design solutions for the construction of public infrastructure and real estate development. Uh, land development which includes uh, land planning, civil engineering, landscape architecture, mobility, and our environmental services is one of the largest practices at WGI. Uh, we have a nationwide uh, client base and project resume. And collectively, our firm has uh, almost 600 professionals uh, across 18 offices. And our, our land development professionals are highly concentrated across our, our Florida and, uh, and Texas markets. Um, so if you do have any questions throughout uh, the one hour uh, today, you can submit them via the chat or the Q&A tab of your Zoom browser uh, at any point. We're going to monitor that as it goes. Um, if, they're, if they get to be kind of numerous on a certain subject or, or complex, what we may ask for you is to either just wait till the end, or if we could get uh, contact information, we can contact you and discuss it uh, in more detail. Uh, for engineers and other licensed professionals, we can provide a certificate as well following the program for anyone who attends uh, for 50 minutes or longer uh, for your continuing ed uh, documentation. I know there's several uh, professions that are up this year. Uh, if you'd like a certificate to document for continuing ed purposes, don't hesitate to request one from us um, and you can contact uh, either uh, Brett or myself in order to, uh, in order to get that. Uh, so without further delay, we will uh, we'll get going. And, um, and so we're going to begin with an area that is near and dear to me. Um, I focused on land use and zoning entitlements for really all of my career. Uh, and I guess, yes, I am a glutton for punishment, but uh, I have been doing this for about, uh, again, 21 years uh, in, the, in the South Florida area. And so our land development entitlements are really split into two major categories. We have uh, land use and, and zoning approvals. Land use approvals are considered legislative, while zoning is, for the most part, considered quasi-judicial. The main difference uh, here in regards to land use approvals is that you are following the policies uh, of the governing agency's comprehensive plan. So changes to that plan need to be approved by the municipality or county and become a lot harder to justify than zoning changes and that there's a lot of subjectivity in the review and ultimately in the vote uh, from the elected officials. So, Another way to put it is that they don't like the color of your shirt uh, the day of the hearing, uh, you know, you, you could be in trouble. 
This, uh, this is kind of in contrast to a zoning change whereby there are certain criteria listed in, listed in the, the governing code, their, their uh, land development code. Uh, and if you meet that criteria, the elected officials are supposed to uh, support the application. Of course, this isn't the case either, as we know, as many codes have a lot of uh, subjectivity written into them as well. But my point being here, is that there's a lot more risk getting through entitlements when the land use amendment applications uh, start to enter uh, the equation. So um, in regards to uh, the comprehensive plans and those land use amendments um, in, in South Florida here, we're again, we're dealing, you've probably heard the term small versus large scale amendments. Most recent change being those small scale amendments have gone from 10 acres uh, up to 50, which is a huge change because it keeps, it, or at least it can keep, um, those uh, those small scale applications within the municipality and not have to go to a state wide level for review, which typically lengthens the approval process. Now, not all municipalities and counties have embraced the change or are going to embrace the change, um, but uh, but that is something that that will be helpful, especially with parcels uh, in our area getting getting so small that that 50 acre threshold will be helpful. Um, but we, you know, obviously there is a complexity, as I mentioned, to the review of the agencies, and it is dependent on the location. A lot of the changes that you have to make in Palm Beach County are different than what's going to happen in Broward, or there's different going than what is happening in Miami Dade. So, what you really need is a kind of a, a team of, of local uh, professionals, and it's getting more diverse in nature. Um, what, you know, what we're noticing is at the land use level, the applications have become uh, a lot more specific and we're not just dealing at that 30,000 foot level anymore. Uh, they're starting to drill down and actually have a, a lot of the, app, the zoning applications and site plan applications run concurrently. So you really do need to kind of assemble a team right from the get go, at, even, at the, uh, even at the land use level. And obviously there are issues in regards to within that comp plan in uh, overlays and the tier systems that, that we need to be mindful of again, uh, incredibly dependent on uh, on where we are um, geographically, the density intensity needs that you're going to have, and as well as the age of the land use designations, because a lot of these comp plans that we're dealing with um, are incredibly old, and we have a lot of changes in the in um, in how development is progressing. And frankly, those those comp plans just uh, just haven't caught up. And in regards to zoning, we touched on the approval process a bit. These applications typically include rezonings and requested uses and some level of master and site plan. Uh, what we're finding more and more is the need for flexibility in the development regulations. Uh, changes in the development industry are moving faster. Uh, and frankly, they're moving faster than the codes and the comp plans can be modified. So the development ind industry is reacting to the changes, uh, trying to be agile and trying to keep up with, with the industry. Uh, bottom line though is the codes for the most part aren't forward thinking enough and, and modifying them is, is burden, uh, burdensome to the developer and the applicant. So uh, the, there's, there's uh, issues with, at that point. Um, it includes the adaptability of uses within a project, uh, changing parking ratio needs, uh, density considerations, the rise of the drive-through and the pickup spaces, what we've seen with COVID, uh, the decrease in the commercial market and the increase in the distribution market, all regions we are seeing an uptick in variances and waiver requests and uh, code uh, language requests for modifications, um, as well as the, you know, the kind of, again, the rise of uh, mixed use zoning districts, which uh, have been created to, to help kind of circumvent some of those code requirements, make it more flexible and uh, provide for flexibility and adapt to, to kind of ch that uh, changing uh, development environment. All right, Jeff. Uh, well, I think that's all we have time for today. Appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, no, but seriously, Jeff, from, from starting out calling me old, uh, not letting me introduce myself, talking for 45 minutes on land use regulation and zoning, and then handing me environmental requirements to talk about. I figure you just finished the presentation, Brett. Yeah, starting to think you don't like me. But uh, all right, guys, uh, environmental requirements, it's, <laughs> it's the boogeyman, right? It's the black hole. It's the voodoo-driven topic of land development. Um, it's not nearly as scary as it seems. It's, you know, it, it, but it has the potential to stop any land development project 
right in its tracks. Um, from having multiple jurisdictions that you have to permit through or, or uh, required to get approval from, through the protection of threatened and endangered species like the crested caracara or the three horned blue spotted tree frog, um, to preserving uplands and upland habitats, um, contaminated areas and remediation, archaeological cultural resources, aquatic preserves, you know, it, it runs the entire gamut of that. Um, and it, basically the bottom line is, is us as land development consultants and, and land developers in the same sense, we need to balance kind of our, in our duty as environmental stewards of our natural resources with, with responsible development in our land, of our lands. And, um, in a lot of cases, that, that's that's what we have a dedicated group here that's been focused on. Obviously, um, we need you need professionals to guide you through all the, uh, the the gamut of environmental requirements on any land development project, and more specifically, um, it, it helps to have professionals that were involved in the writing of the policies that that govern all of our environmental regulations. With that, Jeff, I'll be a little shorter than you. And impact fees. So is this, you know, as if having to pay for your planning and, and civil service wasn't enough, not to mention your land use attorney fees for those on the call, um, an important consideration, obviously, in the preparation of the client's pro forma, which we're involved with a lot, is the uh, is the impact of the impact fee and these obviously these are associated with the anticipated impacts the development will have on local infrastructure and facilities uh, usually based on a kind of a per square foot based on the use uh, and you know those typical impacts may be local uh, impacts on the local roadway network uh, police and fire uh, water meter hookup fees and then for residential uses it goes beyond that in regards to uh, fees associated with school board, parks and rec fees, and facilities, you know, such as uh, libraries and uh, other government facilities. So, but what we are seeing is uh, more of an impact is now, uh, going back to, to Brett's point on environmental, is uh, tree mitigation. Uh, so municipalities and counties are putting a, a higher value on existing uh, tree canopies uh, and native trees. And, uh, and what it means, what, what they're using it as a means is to, to almost make it more cost effective for you to keep keep trees in place, as opposed to trying to mitigate for them or relocating them. Um, in addition to that, we're seeing, uh, you know, a rise in the affordable or workforce housing uh, fees, and we're going to discuss that on a specific, uh, specific side a little later. Um, but that's really started to, to burden the residential developments. Um, and then dependent on the municipality, there are uh, obviously different priorities based on kind of the culture of the municipality we're dealing with. And that may be uh, some areas like Palm Beach Gardens that put a, a you know, a price on, on parks, others like Coral Springs that put a price on um, art and public places. And so uh, it, it's really, again, dependent on the location. And the big question that needs to be asked, though, is, you know, are there exceptions for any proposed development project? Um, is there an agricultural exemption, uh, accessory structure exemption? Are you a 55 and older residential community and don't have to pay school fees? And so uh, and then in addition to that, what, what types of credits may be involved based on the uh, based on the proposed development as well. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. And uh, again, a lot of that has to happen at, uh, at the initial due, uh, due diligence phase. Stormwater management and drainage now we're getting into to my scope of the world as an engineer. Uh, stormwater in South Florida is one of the most uh, critical components of, of a, a, at the very onset of a land development project. We don't have the luxury in South Florida of, of having the natural fall across our sites. We don't have a lot of natural um, water bodies or water courses that we can drain, in, drain into. What we've got, we've got man-made canals and we've got a half foot fall across the 700 acre parcel. So what that typically means is, um, and then we've also got a high water table. So that means we require a lot more area um, for storage and for attenuation for our, our land development projects. 
Um, but there's always exceptions to the rule. You know, general rule of thumb, any engineer will ask you for between 10 and 20% of your property to be set aside for stormwater management. And as an engineer, you probably want to ask for 20% at the beginning, just in case we find out that we don't have a legal positive outfall. And in that case, we've got to retain the 100 year, three day storm event on site with zero discharge, um, which isn't the ideal situation. But typically um, you can count on somewhere between 10 and 15% of, your, of the property being dedicated to a stormwater management facility. Um, you, legal positive outfall, um, you wanna look at that anytime, right at the beginning of a project. Uh, you want to make sure that you've got some kind of water body, some kind of core, some kind of publicly owned stormwater system that's adjacent uh, to your property that you can you can drain into. Um, we've also got Chauncey cases in, in South Florida, and, and that's basically the uh, Chauncey cases don't always get picked up in um, a title search uh, because they date back to the beginning of the 20th century. So there's a lot of cases where the water management, local water management district will own right up to the front door of somebody's house or, or a portion of your property that you're looking to develop without it ever showing up in the title search. And it takes time to clear those, those chancery cases. Uh, it just adds some complexity to uh, any land development project. You wanna make sure that you're clearing those out right at the onset um, of, a, of a project. And then, we're looking more and more at uh, TMDLs, uh, total max, maximum daily load, um, and that's for pollutants. We wanna make sure that, that we're looking at treatment trains or, or some kind of other technology to pull the pollutants out of the, uh, the stormwater runoff before we discharge into our uh, legal positive outflow. And so Brett, and this, is, this comes up a lot in our, um, in our issues with uh, gaining the entitlements through uh, neighborhood issues because you know one of the top ones is is drainage um, because a lot of a lot of folks uh, flood a lot of the old communities weren't designed properly back in the day um, or just have substandard um, uh, piping uh, that probably needs repair replacement or what have you so intrinsically mm -hmm. I think that we're going to exacerbate a problem uh, with with a new development to beside us so it's it's something that we deal with in regards to kind of the 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 lobbying politicking side of it a lot because drainage is probably one of the top three issues that we continually have to deal with. Yeah, Jeff, to, con to continue on that statement too, again, we have a lot of uh, out-of-state uh, clients out of the area and maybe don't have a lot of experience in South Florida that don't really understand why we have to set aside so much of the property uh, for stormwater management. And, and again, a big reason is because because of the high water table and the lack of fall across the site, we just we don't have that that volumetric storage available. So, and the only way to get that is to expand the size of the lakes during design. Right. And so, um, you know, another one that has come up, and it's uh, it's something that's been talked about for. For a number of years, um, but but not really dealt with is the the affordable housing issue, and so you know in Florida we have 900 people moving to the state every day. That's over 300,000 people a year are are moving into Florida, and we are double the average uh, the average growth of the growth rate of the rest of the country. Um, and so and but and they're not flocking to the middle of the state. They're not flocking to to where there's you know. Uh, there's that that huge swath of available land they're coming to the developed areas and they're coming to areas where housing inventory is already stressed um, available land is dwindling and the the cost of housing is skyrocketing and, and we absolutely have an affordability crisis in the south florida area and and, and when we say that we're, we're not talking about hundreds of units we're talking Tens of thousands of units per county that that we have to that we have to deal with, and and uh, to say that you know I would say over the last maybe 15 years it's something that, that that started to come up with that that the counties and municipalities wanted to deal with, um, and we haven't made a dent. Um, and folks, they they simply can't afford home ownership, and and just like DE and I issues that uh, a lot of firms are dealing with, everybody is recognizing the issue. 
everyone is issuing statements about the issue, but very few are doing anything about the issue. And so a lot of municipalities or counties that are trying to do something about it, uh, pre predominantly are placing what is a societal problem on the developer and they're placing it on the residential developer. Um, so we just talked about the costs of impact fees um, and everything else that burdens a project. Um, not to mention the, the cost of land, uh, not to mention uh, some of the density issues that, that certain areas face, it, it creates a burden on a single industry that, that alone it's not gonna solve. In fact, it's not even going to make a dent. But regardless of that, it's something that, especially our residential develop, uh, development clients are going to have to deal with. And a lot of times it comes down to you know, two different things. It comes down to, uh, a zoning code requirement um, to provide certain amount of either affordable or workforce housing units, either on site or in a buyout situation um, where a certain percentage of the units are going to have to be provided uh, for, uh, for affordable or, or, or workforce housing. Um, and, but, but a lot of times it's, it's coupled with, you know, density bonus programs that can be that, that can be included to, I guess, to offset that cost. Um, however, they haven't been very successful. Um, they've been successful, or I think at least they can make it work on, especially on the rental side of the market, but on the for sale side of the market, we, we haven't seen the success. Um, and so it's, um, it's had, a, it's had a, a, a really tough impact because it's a, it's a huge issue that everyone recognized uh, recognizes we have to deal with it within uh, kind of the, the residential development industry. And at the same time, I think there's frustration because we're, we're, we're not really making any progress because of it. Um, and so I think there needs to be kind of a, a, a you know, a larger look at as, as communities, how we deal with it and, and not, uh, not just burdened on, uh, on one, uh, one portion of the industry. Utilities. Uh, utilities, when we're talking about it in the sense of land development for the purposes of, of this conversation, it has more to do with your wet utilities. It's your water, your wastewater, and your reclaimed water. Um, so, you know, the process that we go about looking for water and wastewater is largely similar. Uh, we start off with the questions in the due diligence period, typically of, is there public water accessible? If it's successful, how far is it away? What are the costs associated with bringing it to, to our site? Uh, do we have to cross water courses? Are we looking at jack and bore? Are we looking at aerial crossings or directional drill? All these different types of synopsis that, that affect um, the cost of the extension of the, publicly, the, the public system to our site for development. Um, and then does, does the utility provider have capacity for your project? If they have capacity for your project, what is the process of, of accessing and reserving that capacity? And, and sometimes it's an expensive and, and lengthy process to get there. And that's, you know, this, we're talking at the very onset of a project. Um, so we, we want to make sure we're, we're looking at, at, at all of that. And then again, if, if we don't have any kind of public uh, utility provider or public uh, utility close to us, then what are my what are my options for on-site? On-site water supply and, and on-site uh, treatment and disposal. There's there's rules and there's criteria that are involved in, in both of those as well. Um, what's the quality of the water that you're getting from the aquifer if you're looking at a water source? Um, and, and typically you're not going to know that unless you involve uh, you have a high hydrogeologist that's on board with you that, that has an idea or um, you have relationships with a hydrogeologist that, that knows in general what you're looking at in that area. The further west we get driven because our coastal areas are, are developed right now, that freshwater resource becomes a, a more, on, more and more of a demand and it becomes a more expensive resource to bring to your, your project. Um, as far as wastewater treatment, you know, we, we know that FDEP limits on-site treatment to 10,000 gallons per day. That's not that many units. That's not a huge residential development. However, um, there are always exceptions to this rule. 
and uh, and obviously we, we've learned how to uh, how to properly support the request for those exceptions. Um, and then we go to, we look at reclaimed water as well, and, and and reclaimed water is becoming more and more prevalent in South Florida, uh, as it is the rest of the country. And it, we got to find out if there is uh, reclaimed water available to our site. And then the second question, the question that a lot of developers ask, are am I required um, to connect to that reclaimed water system? Sometimes it can be cheaper to to install wells for your irrigation purposes. Sometimes people just want to pull off the potable water for whatever reason. Sometimes the reclaimed water is available directly adjacent to your site, but your utility owner doesn't have capacity. They've already reserved capacity or, or promised capacity to, to um, other projects. So these are all considerations in that utility, in our utility entitlement process that we have to go through. But and Brett, how, but how important is it to, to recognize th those answers up front because you know you, you talk about entitlements and, and you can get through you know a certain amount of entitlements on the planning side um, without really needing to know all of those answers necessarily. But um, you know you, you, it comes at a cost. So how important is it to to know those answers up front as opposed to kind of down the line once once maybe a, a zoning issue is resolved. Yeah, Jeff, it, it's absolutely huge, um, especially for our clients, because uh, it, it takes a, you can't just broad brush it, look at a GIS map, understand how close uh, any kind of public utility is to your site, and then just m make an estimation of what it's going to cost to br bring it to you. Um, there, are, there are several cases where you, you look at something that might be seven miles away and, and cost three and a half million dollars or five million dollars to bring to your site. That, that our developer partners either have to make sure that they got in their pro forma, it works for them, or have to start looking at on-site uh, treatment and supply options as well. And again, sometimes the by nature of the rule, they are on-site options are excluded by rule. So you have no choice at that point in time than to extend those publicly uh, owned and operated mains to your site, which can be costly at times. And owners, you know, we, we have to make sure that owners know this as early on in the project as possible. And uh, and one of my favorites, neighbor, neighborhoods and, and, and politics. Um, you know, it's uh, obviously inherent in the, in the entitlement process. And so it's, uh, just just like Brett was suggesting, it's it's important to know kind of that that information up front. It, it's the same as in regards to where you're heading from a lobbying and political standpoint. And you know, as um, as uh, over the last, I would say, even maybe 15 years again, um, lobbying is has become even more prevalent because of the advent of social media. Um, it gives the ability for especially community groups to communicate a lot quicker. It gives them the ability to organize a lot quicker. Uh, the availability of information is a lot easier, and especially in regards to what has been submitted. Um, and so it's important to include that as, as part of kind of your, your upfront due diligence. Um, as to what's going to impact your project. And obviously we need to know about, you know, certain things which may be embedded in either a, uh, a government approved regulation or uh, a comprehensive plan or a zoning code as it relates to certain areas or districts. You know, uh, a lot of examples, especially uh, for some of the older communities is the historical preservation districts. What is the impact on a project? How is that going to impact the cost of of development and architecture, uh, those types of issues. Uh, we see a lot where, you know, again, 15, 20 years ago, everybody was developing uh, the, the farmland out west. Now we see a lot of those areas being uh, protected. Uh, what are the impacts of and, and the new regulations that, that impact those areas? Um, and uh, and what's, uh, what's that going to mean for your project? Um, and we have a lot of redevelopment areas. Obviously, we have a lot of older communities that, that need redevelopment. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, not, just, not just to the east, 
um, but some along the major corridors that um, that are going to fall within a, a redevelopment area. And that may that may be uh, a, a local ordinance. It may be it may be at a, a state level. Um, it may be a CRA. Um, Again, it may be beneficial to you, um, but uh, obviously those are those are different regulations that need to be understood and uh, to see how it's going to impact you. Uh, airport overlays, I mean, we could go on and on. Um, it, it seems like almost everything um, nowadays somehow falls within some type of uh, some type of overlay and and neighborhood groups have gotten uh, really savvy. And so what they have done is they have seen the uh, potential for development around them, and they have organized uh, hired planners, hired uh, experts to put together neighborhood plans. Um, and those plans are ratified by government bodies. And so um, if you fall within one of them, they, uh, it's going to have an impact because then it makes it a lot harder to, to possibly do something that you, you wanna do because uh, now they have really dictated um, what they want to see with an area uh, which they don't even own, um, but it, but it's going to impact you. And, and you know we we see it uh, we see it here, especially in Palm Beach County. There's several areas that have had neighborhood plans that are you know well within the urban service line uh, that you would think would be appropriate for development, especially knowing you know the the pressure that that goes out west, and yet there's limitations because of these neighborhood plans. Uh, that have uh, that have been uh, put in place. So, it um, it's uh, it's it's another consideration and uh, another reason why it's it's really important uh, nowadays to meet with these neighborhood groups up front um, because uh, because they do have a say, they do have a seat at the table, um, and it needs to needs to be part of the process. And so, you know, a big question is what is the what is the neighborhood group that you're dealing with? Is this uh, is this a large uh, community group that uh, you know constitutes a lot of different HOAs that has a lot of political pull, um, a lot of votes, um, or is it just a singular HOA that may have just one issue to deal with, or frankly, it, is it both? Is it a larger group that you need to deal with some of the macro issues, and is it you know an individual HOA that you're adjacent to that there there may be a smaller issue in regards to buffering or setbacks that that you need to deal with. Um, and so there's there's a lot of balance in regards to knowing who the players are and uh, properly how uh, how to address them. And so uh, you know going into those uh, I guess I want to say negotiations or or discussions with those community groups there there's important considerations to have which is is the request by right um, you know is this going to go before a governing body where it's a a public hearing and and all these folks are going to be noticed. Because uh, we know you're not going to be able to go up before an elected body and say, well, yeah, no, they were all uh, they were all noticed. We just didn't meet with them or didn't care to meet with them. Those, I mean, that that no longer exists. Um, so especially in the the public hearing process, um, the neighbors need to be uh, need to be part of the the discussion. The other thing, you know, obviously that we deal with is even if it is by right, um, whether it's from a planner's perspective or whether it's from the client's perspective, is are you going to be doing business there again, um, and uh, and how uh, how deep do you need to engage with these folks, even if it's a even if it's a buy right issue, knowing you're probably going to be coming back and, and asking for something else in the future. Um, so there absolutely needs to be uh, you know a, a public outreach strategy and a lobby a lobbying effort uh, strategy that is put together at the onset of the project uh, and carried out. Uh, obviously. You know, and, and typically what we see is that that tends to change as we go through the process um, based on uh, based on the approval process and, and kind of the, you know, the, the outside factors that we may not necessarily see right away. Um, and then then you have to know the makeup of the, the governing body exactly who's who's on what board. Um, the advisory boards you're going to have to go to the elected officials that you're going to have to go before uh, the votes that you're going to need um, and frankly the election cycle. Um, because uh, it, especially if, if it's a, whether it's district wide or, or it's a certain district that you're in and there's a, there's a council member or a commissioner that that's their district, obviously you need to uh, understand what approach you're going to employ in order to engage that and, uh, and know when, uh, when they're going to be up for votes again. Um, 
so uh, to, to that point, it, it is important to consult with the local elect, elected officials and we need to coordinate a communication plan with the municipality. And so uh, when we're asking what is the, the hierarchy and, and what is appropriate, um, you know, that's because do, do you start at the staff level? Do you start at the manager level? Uh, do you start at the, the mayor level or the district commissioner level? Those are all questions that kind of need to be asked at the forefront. Um, because you want to make sure that uh, you're not upsetting the, uh, you know, the, the hierarchy as you, uh, as you go forward. Um, another important thing is you never let your elected officials learn about your project through the media or through the neighbors. Um, that's, that's, uh, we want to be upfront with the request. We want to gain their input. We want to make them feel part of the process because ultimately they're going to be. Um, so it's important to include those elected officials uh, up front. And again, I'll... Uh, uh, all land use is politics and all politics are local. And, and uh, you know, it, again, it's, it's important to, to know who you're dealing with, uh, the players involved on, on both sides, whether it's the, uh, the HOA side and, and the, the resident side, as well as the, uh, the elected official side. You're on mute, Brett. We, we don't mind, but we'd like to, I guess we'd like to hear from you. Hey, thank you. I was muted. My apologies, Jeff. Hey, back to that last slide. I had a question for you real quick. A lot of times um, when it comes to neighborhood and political issues, um, we work in conjunction with land use attorneys. Is that, you know, again, is this kind of a combined effort between our land development group and land use attorneys, or is it more in, in one of the other group's hands to, to kind of lead our land development clients through this? You're muted. Now. I just did the same thing. Yes. Um, it's uh, it's dependent on the location. Uh, I think it's dependent on on uh, on on who knows who, frankly, uh, in certain areas. Um, but typically, we we want it to be a collaborative approach. Especially, listen, the the projects aren't getting easier, and, and the more complex it is, the, the 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 more need there is for 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 both services, right? Um, and so. Uh, you know, there's obviously some smaller projects that aren't going to need, I think, uh, some of the level of lobbying that, that typically comes with, with maybe a land use attorney, and you can get by with, with a, a team of, of professionals without them. Um, but we're seeing more and more the, the complex projects. Uh, it's it's going to be a collaborative effort with, with all those disciplines working simultaneously. And then the most important part is all communicating to have those plans in place. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody's, you know, marching to the same beat. Gotcha. Yeah, great. Um, so let's talk about traffic impacts and, and access to, to parcels. Um, obviously, one of the first things we have to know is the jurisdictional agency that we're going through and what their requirements are. Are they going to require just a traffic analysis or they're going to require a traffic study? What, what level of effort is going to be required to to look at this. And um, in addition, who is the one that prescribes the scope of the study that, that's going to be required? Is it the county? Is it the local municipality? Is it the public works department? Is it the traffic department or the transportation department? So obviously having those relationships is, is uh, highly important when, you, when you're starting to look at the traffic impacts for any particular development. Um, you also have to understand any kind of potential, um, the significance of any mitigations that you're gonna make. Are you gonna have to require right away to, to install another lane for this project? Are you gonna have to look at putting in a triple left turn lane? Are you gonna have to enclose now an open, uh, open canal that was, that was adjacent to the property? And what kind of cost opinions those are going, or impacts they're gonna have on, on any project? So it's important to know, obviously, to have knowledge of, of what level of tra traffic analysis is required and what are the, the tripping thresholds, whether it's size um, or number of daily trips or whatever the, the case may be. Um, in addition to that, you want to make sure you, you understand what offsite requirements you're going to be required just for vehicular access to your development. Um, Excel lanes, what's the throat length? What's my decel lane length? acceleration lanes, uh, median cuts. If you're gonna to have to 
cut your median and able to get uh, a left turn into your site. What are you allowed to do? Is it right, right out own way? Is it going to be left or right out? Um, and, and all of these obviously impact the design um, of any particular land development project. Um, and again, Jeff knows a little yeah. bit more, is more familiar with the implication and impact fees that uh, that are required from the traffic analysis. Yeah, so, so we, we hand it off to you, Jeff. Yeah, we touched a little, we, we touched a little bit on the, the the local impact fees in regards to you know the the impacts on the roadways, um, you know, which you pay at time of building permit. Um, but there's also um, the proportionate share program in the Florida statutes, which um, uh, essentially is that if you have an impact on a roadway and a certain improvement is needed, um, you need to pay, not you don't have to construct, but you do need to pay for your proportionate share or percentage share of the impact on that improvement. So if it's a, it's a turn lane, if it's an intersection widening, uh, what have you, you need, to, uh, you need to pay for that. So that, that's a process that's done again through the entitlement process as the traffic study is reviewed by whatever the governing body is. And uh, it may have an impact on a, a county road, it may have impact on a state road. And so dependent on, on those impacts is kind of where uh, those funds go, or at least there's a discussion on how those funds are, are split. But, um, and, it, and it is a negotiation because it, it is somewhat subjective in regards to what the actual cost of the improvement is going to be. And so you do have to go through a process with those review agencies, a lot of times with the uh, traffic or engineering departments uh, with the governing bodies in regards to what is the improvement going to be, what is the cost, and what is, uh, what is the development's impact on that cost. And, uh, and those become part of uh, the development orders um, as they go through the entitlement process. You know, the important thing to note here is that you really need to have an understanding as to what your ultimate goal is on the plan, because, you know, the, the, the proportionate share fee is going to be based on, you know, a certain number of trips on the roadway uh, or on that on that improvement. Um, and should you modify your application to maybe change your use or increase intensity or density, that obviously is going to have an increase in your uh, traffic impact, which invariably will change the, uh, the prop share fee. So uh, it's, it's important to understand where you want your end game to be um, because uh, it, it's, another, it's gonna be another process to have to go through it should, uh, should, those, uh, should those impacts increase. And then unique, uh, unique design constraints. Uh, I mean, let's be real. Um, you know, the majority of projects are are not the pristine, uh, vacant, or farmland that we're used to designing 20 years ago. We're we're a lot, a lot of time now dealing with those pieces that we said, hell no, there's no way we're ever going to develop on that piece. Uh, those are the ones that are coming uh, through our door now. And so inherently, there, there's a lot of issues with them. And uh, you know, you, you, a lot more than what's just on the slide here. But uh, and a, a lot of times, uh, going back to one of the earlier issues, is there's environmental impacts. Because a, a lot of those pieces uh, had environmental issues that nobody wanted to deal with in the past. Um, but, but they're coming back around now. So that, that's, it, it makes those environmental issues really, uh, really important to have to understand and, and, and deal with. You know, are, are there protected areas on the on the site? Um, you know, other uh, other pieces of land that are being looked at are uh, have contamination issues. Um, I mean, you know, you see a lot of times now us looking at um, golf courses and golf course conversions. Um, obviously, there's environmental issues there and contamination issues uh, that have to be dealt with. And uh, in addition to that, there's a lot of uh, compatibility issues. We're we're dealing with uh, especially with infill pieces, you're going back into existing communities uh, where there's adjacency issues and you do have compatibility issues that come up and kind of it's one of the top three, right? When we talk about uh, the, the NIMBY, the not in my backyard issues and that's traffic, it's drainage and it's uh, the compatibility. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, uh, that's become uh, an issue uh, with the, kind of the properties, especially in this area, that, that what's left. 
Um, you know, the other thing is uh, the urban service lines that were set a long time ago. You know, a lot of time, uh, same thing with those comp plans that were developed originally back, you know, could be 40 years ago. Um, those urban service lines were set uh, a long time ago as well. And is that really the appropriate place for it? Well, it may not be in 2021, but the fact is, is in order to, to move those is, is a giant lift. Uh, same as, you know, is, is it a, an appropriate tier to be in now? You know, well, it, this shouldn't be a rural tier anymore. This should be an urban tier. Well, you know, the, the lift of, of modifying those is, is incredible. So uh, it's important to understand uh, where, where those lines are. And then in addition to that, we're, we're dealing again with, with property values that are just uh, outrageous at, at this point. And so, you know, the ability to come up with a development program that can actually turn a dollar uh, is becoming incredibly difficult, uh, not to mention a lot of those uh, burdensome uh, fees associated with, uh, with uh, the, the municipalities or, or governing bodies that, that, that they level on these, uh, on these pieces. Uh, okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, floodplains, waters of the U.S. So I, I'll start talking about floodplains and, and how FEMA uh, interacts with, with land development in South Florida and then uh, get into waters of the U.S. and waters of Florida, um, which are a little more cumbersome to talk about. Uh, FEMA floodplains, we all know that, that uh, finished floors are established at, that, that they have to be at or above the 100-year floodplain elevation. However, there are some um, unique jurisdictional requirements that require a bit of freeboard. So um, it's not uncommon that we will be permitting in a jurisdiction that requires a one foot freeboard. So we've got to be one foot over the, the 100 year FEMA floodplain elevation. Um, in addition to that, there's also uses, certain uses that either the client or um, the municipality requires to have a higher level of separation from the floodplain, maybe maybe even up at the 500 year floodplain. Sometimes uh, emergency operation centers, um, places that don't want to have any kind of uh, impact with, with any uh, heavy flooding event. Um, data centers are also another one of those that, that wanna make sure that they're up and running 24 hours a day. It's, it's critical that they're up and running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so in those cases, and those are usually based on the, the client's needs more than anything else. Um, and then engineered floodplain, th this is more commonly the uh, designers modeled flood stages. Um, they're not FEMA recognized, but it's, we're required to model the stormwater system um, to determine what stages the, the certain rain events uh, come up to in the development, just to make sure that we're protected, make sure the roadways, roadways are clear in the three-year event. Um, and that we're not discharging waters off our site, anything uh, below the 25 year three day event. Uh, but that comes up through the design process. Um, waters of the US. I reached out to our environmental scientists and, and I asked for just a little bit of clarification because I know there's some, there's new laws and regulations as it regards to waters of the US and, and specifically waters of the state. And I got three pages of stuff that I could start reading straight from the page, or I could go through it and kind of give you the um, the Cliff's Notes version as I understand it. So, so bear Let's with me. Let's do that one. Let's do What's that. that? One. Let's do that one, Brett. The Cliff Notes. The Cliff's Notes. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or the participants would start to tail off real quick. Um, so, 2020, the Na Navigable Waters Protection Rule (NWPR) um, was implemented, and that actually narrowed. Uh, what was previously considered the federal jurisdictional wetlands. So it actually, from a federal standpoint, it narrowed what they have, what they have rule over. A lot of that went into the hands of the state. Now, um, there are times right now, because of its nuance and newness, that the state necessarily wasn't prepared to handle all of um, all of the submittals applications that they're getting. So they're, they're getting through that process, but it's made development a, a little more, um, a little more prickly as we try to get, get through the, the waters of the state and waters of the U S and, and any kind of uh, jurisdictional permitting requirement. Um, in general, the army Corps has retained waters of the United States for tidal waters, 
and freshwater wetlands located 300 feet within 300 feet of any tidal water body. So that's what the Corps of Engineers still has jurisdiction over. And then the state has taken over all other waters. So I think that's a, an important distinction. With that, now I'll kind of transfer to waters of the state and, and explain what the, um, the permitting process through uh, the state in, in titles. Um, so there, any kind of wetland or any kind of surface water that meets the Florida Administrative Code definition is gonna require either an exemption, a written exemption, a general permit, or an environmental resource permit. So everything's gotta be permitted in effect that has to do with any kind of wetland, whether it's isolated or not, and any kind of water body. However, if it's less than a half acre of impacts, then we don't have to mitigate for it. We don't have to go to the mitigating banks and, and God knows the mitigation banks are, it's, it's not always consistent if there's gonna be availability uh, in the mitigation banks. But in general, um, within the state also, FDEP will permit a certain amount of, of jurisdictional uh, applications and then the rest go to the water management districts. DEP typically has single family homes or marinas and docks that, that aren't associated with any kind of upland program. Um, they have special uses, they permit landfills as well. Um, but the water management districts have the responsibility of permitting all their other activities and, and mostly for commercial and residential, that's where we're gonna be go, going is to permit through the environmental re resource permit process through the water management districts in Florida. And with that, Jeff, if I get any deep, deeper into waters of the state or waters of the U.S., I am out of my element. So I'll stop. Fair enough. Thanks, Brett. And just uh, as a as a bonus, uh, uh, our eleventh topic here, and it's, it's just going to take me a minute, but I thought it was important to add was uh, was parking. Um, I think uh, just based on the the changes that we see in the development industry, um, parking uh, has become a huge issue. Uh, and, and you see a lot of difference of opinions dependent on the, the municipality or governing body that you're dealing with. Um, mobility is changing, especially in um, urban areas. Um, parking ratios are changing. And, and again, it's something that I don't think the zoning codes that are, are, are really keeping up with. And it's just the development trends, um, the societal trends of, of how people want to move around, um, the need for parking. Um, and, and frankly, the, the, the fact that we overpark for a lot of, of what we design um, uh, is a, an important consideration. And that's why you see a lot of these, these applications that ask for variances and relief on parking, because frankly, they are overparked. Um, and, and number one, it affects the developer's bottom line because there, there's the ability to include it in uh, an additional density and intensity. But uh, secondly, um, you know, and, and from I think the municipality standpoints, they need to look at it as a plus in regards to what can we do with a little extra area in regards to green space, in regards to uh, helping out with uh, certain open areas or helping preserve a little bit more. Uh, the, these are the types of things that we can do with, uh, with kind of the changing development patterns that could help alleviate some of those other areas that, uh, that they have concerns with. With Brett, I'll let you close it out for us. Five rules of land development. Some of these are gonna tie in together. Um, make sure I'm not muted, I'm not good, okay. So again, this is something that, that we at WGI have looked at and, and subscribed to. It's, it's always make sure you're checking your email and your voicemail constantly. Land development is a, is a, um, is a, is a quick burn, quick turn process in industry. And we've got to make sure that, that we're paying as much attention to our clients as we possibly can. Um, but in addition to that, I'll add to this, Jeff, because it's not just email and voicemail anymore. Now it's Teams, right? People transfer files through Teams. It's Twitter. I I'm sure there's something you can do with LinkedIn. There's probably something in Facebook we can always look. But again, what I'm getting at is, is making sure that you're communicating um, with your clients, with the regulatory authorities, with the entire development team. Uh, number two um, also has a tie to number five after number two hits. But just the knowledge of what goes up must come down. Jeff and I both have showed you that, that we have over 20 years of land development experience. 
that means we were here in 2007 in South Florida when it, the phone went from ringing off the hook to not ringing at all. Um, so you just got to make sure that you're, you're prepared, you're taking advantage of the, of the market when it's up, and you're prepared when the market starts to turn. Make sure you're, you're not walking in with, with blinders. Um, and as consultants, we just, number three, we just want to make sure that we're adding value to any deal that's being made. Um, and we do that by our knowledge, our experience, and our dedication to the project. Um, it's, an important, it's an important process that we make sure we hit. Uh, and relationships matter. It's who you know, it's what you know, it's all of the above. Um, the, the wider that cast of network that you have, the more effective you're going to be at any, any one of these processes, whether it's, it's on the regulating side or the political side, as Jeff had mentioned earlier, is make sure that those relationships are built and, and maintained. And then lastly, again, when number two hits, there's no crying in land development, flat out. It's an industry we all know about, we all understand. Um, so we just got to make sure that when, when, when the bad times hit, we know how to handle it. And with that, uh, Jeff, yes, we want to thank you very much for, for spending the last hour with Jeff and I. Um, if you've got any questions whatsoever and don't want to follow up in uh, in this format, you can always reach out directly to Jeff or myself. Um, we're here and available for anything, any question you may have. Um, and I think with that, Jeff, if you have any closing words, appreciate no, it. Thank, yeah, no, I just thank everybody for your time. Have a great afternoon. Appreciate it. Thank you.